rarely, if ever, are able to actually practice those skills. They just want to be firefighters, squirt water on the fires. They don't want to take care of patients. So as your demand for service increases, they, you should monitor any negative impacts on safety because of the result of sleep deprivation. So you should monitor that regularly because um, 48 hour shifts, for example, can, and there's lots of data to back it up, can be problematic. So you may want to look at a shorter shift skip. Some guys won't like that. But capital facilities planning, the district should create capital facilities plan. Uh, your growing population, new construction will not only result in increased service demand, but also uh, may also shift your call density away from your currently located stations. So you've got to plan for that in the future, have a long-range capital uh, facilities plan. <clears throat> I'll get into the NFPA stuff. Basic billing and other fees. And I think the billing company uh, that's outsourced by EMS probably wasn't really happy with what we said in our report. Um, they, uh, they charge a rate of 9.7%. And we see, we think that's pretty high. And because we see uh, billing companies all over the United States, typically we're seeing 5 to 7% of the amount collected. So that's a bit high in our opinion. Um, nothing I would make a major issue, but possibly <coughs> negotiate a little lower rates. Claire, you want to add to that? We've actually done some, this has caused us to do some actual research on this. I mean, done some research with other billing companies and have actually been checking into that. So it's been a good thing good for us to do some research on And we're not saying they're bad people. Or no, they're awesome. Yeah, they awesome. Uh, and we still might be able to negotiate a lower rate. We did a conference call with them and uh, Claire on there, and I think they had like 35 people on the call. Who is this company? Uh, what's her name? Change Healthcare. Used to be McKesson. And these were people from all over the United States on this call. Um, regardless if you change billing companies or not, you should every year retain an outside firm to do an audit mm -hmm. of billing and collection practices. You need to make sure that um, that proper billing practices are being done, but also they're consistent with uh, the federal government, Office of the Inspector General. So no matter who does your billing, you should do that annually. They get really picky about that stuff. As uh, things change, things grow, salary and benefit costs increase, you may want to consider um, increasing your, your uh, fees for plan reviews, inspections, and so forth. One benchmark you can use is uh, fees that are found in, in your neighboring jurisdiction. See how your fees compare to other similar jurisdictions. Midterm strategies, approval goal B1, turning in CME. We suggest you transition to an electronic tracking of training, uh, do an annual training activity report. It should be generated and shared throughout, uh, both publicly and throughout the organization. If you get the right records management system, they're often integrated. You usually will have modules that will track all the training for you by personnel. Historical training records should be evaluated to ensure that you have adequate time dedicated um, that meets annual department skills and knowledge requirements as well as the NFPA 1001 requirements which addresses firefighter training. Uh, we suggest deliver serial classes at each of the stations to maximize drill time. Increase your drill and training opportunities to at least once a week and increase the number of multi-company drills to ensure continuity and efficiency of emergency operations. If you drill in Doing multi-company drilling it includes both uh, paid on call and career firefighters. And take a greater advantage of UVU's substantial fire training resources and maximize utilization of services. They have tremendous amount of services. 
They don't provide, they don't charge for their services, and we think the district has under, underutilized this resource. They are a great organization and provide great training. Uh, we suggest updating your standard operating guidelines. Uh, building and fire code responsibilities, eh? I think this is kind of a hot topic. Is it? We think the county council, the building department, and the fire district need to revisit their respective roles in ensuring and enforcing compliance with building, fire, and life safety codes. Each needs to recognize the importance of their individual responsibilities and be willing to compromise to the extent to produce reasonable standards. Um, there's no bad guy here. Now, the building department has their job, fire district has their job, and there may be different priorities for the building department, different priorities for the, for the fire district, but both are very important and valuable. And um, the district, you need to look at other communities of similar size and see the kind of symbiotic relationship that fire departments, and building departments have that work together to do what's in the best interest of the community. It's entirely possible. We see it all over the country. It's time to move on and kind of get that stuff put together. I'm not going to get into details of that, well, but essentially... Go ahead. be in the new copy of this book? Because it's not in the current version. No, I, I'm, it's added in, in the new book. It's a B3. An oversight, to, I missed that. It's too important. I mean, we touched on it in our report, but we didn't put it in our strategies. And again, our fault. Uh, this is another one, hot topic, I'm sure. But I think the county should reconsider reasonable residential sprinkler requirements for new construction. Ultimately, the homeowners will probably realize lower insurance rates, and there's a, about 90 something percent of homes that have sprinklers and a fire occurs, fire is put out, fire is suppressed. Um, I'm suggesting, we're suggesting reasonable rent, uh, residential strength of the Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Not, not so much to you, but just so I'm clear, on those areas on the east side of the Jordanelle Basin, of the Jordanelle Reservoir, where it, we have that longer response time, and since March of 17, the county commission has no longer required buildings for fire safety sprinklers in homes that are attached duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, sixplexes. Uh, would sprinklers not put out those fires before the fire department gets there? That's the idea. 96% of the time. Yeah, okay. They so are required. They're not. They're building my houses right now that are not required. They're not required. And they need to be attached, aren't they required? Yep. Not in single family, not, they're not being installed. They're townhomes, they're since March of 17, they were discontinued having to be in town homes are not required. But in part, they're required. Multi-family, multi-family. Multi-family. Stack family, family. 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 Stack, family. Family. Stack but not sixplexes that are townhouses. So well, if you look at, you know, first of all, if you just uh, look at fire behavior, I don't get into the details of that, but essentially, uh, depending on the nature of the fire, but you got about 10 minutes before you have flashover. And so, if you look at response time, if you live out way out in the boonies somewhere and your house catches fire, it's a little more than likely going to be gone. If they don't get there within 10 minutes and flashover occurs, it's pretty, you know, you got a mess. So, so I'm asking and correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm asking the county commission if they, they would not give the power back to the fire department to be in on the planning and all and the reviews of those. You're considered single family, but they're attached. For fire sprinklers in these areas where your response time is 10, 12, 14 minutes, whatever, based on the record, it would certainly make a difference. And the cost is passed on to the consumer from the builder anyway, so the cost of putting them in is minimal for the safety of the community. You have a conflagration of a sixplex, one catches on fire and doesn't have sprinklers. What are those other five houses going to be done? Same thing. They're all going to burn. I think we're going to, as a county council, we're going to take this uh, 
the information right here under consideration okay. and look at it. And okay. With okay. the help of the advisory, our advisory board and the fire board will come up with something. Thank you. And, and I would look at other community models and see what they're doing. Um, the only problem we have with that is every community model we look at is different. Yeah. There's no consistency whatsoever. You, you pick out what looks the best and what would fit this county the best. There's no perfect model. When you try to find a community our size. Yeah. Yeah, but, yes, I, I think you're, you're about to say that there's a trade-off a huge trade-off between the deployment of sprinkler systems and the fire stations. The former is paid directly by the homeowner, and ex in exchange they get lower insurance rates. The latter is paid by the taxpayers. Well, in terms of sprinklers and fire stations, no. The fire stations are, fi are on the fire are on the taxpayers. The sprinklers. I mean, the homeowners pay taxes also, but right. over time you you get a reduction in your insurance rates um, in, exchange, in, in exchange. You also get lower or not as rapidly rising fire department taxes because you don't have to have quite as many firemen and fire stations put out fires if the sprinkler systems will put them out. You know, I, I, don't, I couldn't say there's a, any data to support that. Or any, it, you might be right. I, I've just not heard that. You can't. Well, if I'm not right. if everybody's house the sprinkler, like we only need like three firefighters. Well, if I'm not right, then we don't yeah. need sprinkler systems. Yeah, well, <laughs> I I guess you can look at it that way. It's like, okay, nobody gets sprinkler. No, I'll then let's put more end. fire stations and more firefighters out there. Yeah. yeah, I ask yeah. It, the person asked is not you, but the person that sells sprinkler systems. Because that's how they're going to justify uh, to a municipality the use of sprinkler systems. That may be true. I think it's like a Chairman Farrell said, we're going to, it was a complex issue, it wasn't unanimous, and we're going to look at it together. I think that's too much of Shall we move on? Or we uh, equipment, inventory, supplies. We're suggesting installing intruder alarms and camera systems in all the stations, especially the other staff. Develop an inventory control policy. All capital and value equipment needs to be uh, inventory audited annually. <coughs> also, establish an apparatus equipment reserve fund. This, uh, fleet replacement cost should be calculated based on the estimated use of the lives. There's a whole process for doing that. Uh, there's uh, actual NFPA standards for that. Property valuations and tax revenues. Property valuation trends should continue to be monitored with annual discussions with the area's economic development teams. We didn't want to get too much into this. Um, property tax revenues are the single largest source of revenue for the district. And we suggest they continue to take advantage of opportunities to thoughtfully, thoughtfully adjust this tax rate. Nobody wants higher taxes. <clears throat> so grant opportunities. Uh, Look at grant opportunities, acquire place equipment through potential grants. Also, um, the district, if you can hire more people, consider pursuing a safer grant. It's a federal grant that you it'll uh, provide funds to hire new people. Uh, usually, the grants go, I think, two or three years, and then you have to take over the, the full cost. But they pay up. They, they'll help you get more staff on. Um, and this could be done right away. It could be a short term. Long term strategies. Fire district government governance. The county council has a myriad of responsibilities beyond those related to the fire district. I worked for county government for nine years. I know what and my I answer directly to the board of county councilors and they have so many issues and so many details. Um, that they have to, to work out. And the model in, in this county is a little bit different. Um, and I'm saying the councils, we say the council's done a great job of providing administrative oversight, but it's an atypical model. Most fire districts throughout the United States are seen by, or seen by an independent board of elected fire commissioners or directors. 
totally independent of the county council. Um, and so we believe that in the long term, you should start looking at uh, what the legal issues are, the potential for um, having the fire district overseen by an elected board of commissioners, because that's all they focus their energy and attention on. They begin to understand all the technical details. And so we think that's a long-term goal that you should look into uh, having a separate board that, that are elected from around the county. There's different models out there. Five to seven member board. And continue to receive input from the Citizen Advisory Board. That was an excellent idea. The Citizen Advisory Board is, is a great group of people that um, can provide input to the fire district and the fire chief about what, where the citizens are coming from. They can provide another perspective. Absolutely continue that, that group. Um, I would hate to see them go away. Fire stations, uh, consider costs and options for adding sufficient sleeping quarters at Heber City Station for a minimum of five to six career personnel. Has that changed, Chief? Has, has that been upgraded or is everybody at midway at night? Still, still same. Heber City Station begin long range capital facilities planning to eventually replace and relocate the fire station. A new station should have include a training center with all the appropriate classroom facilities, training props. This doesn't all have to be done at once. Uh, it can be done incrementally, but Beaver City at some point is probably going to need an, a new fire station. I would plan it out to get enough property uh, to include a training center adjacent to a new fire station. Timber Lakes and Walsburg stations, they're essentially they're just storage facilities. There's no bathrooms, there's no, uh, I didn't see, even see any storage or non-equipment. They're just essentially garages, unless I miss something on my associate. Thing. So I would consider upgrading those stations, again, long-term capital facilities plan. Also, regularly monitor service demand in order to determine current and future needs for staffing at the other stations. So we uh, did a, just a GIS thing on um, uh, a proposed fire station, a new station, and it's not easy to see on, on a slide, but essentially, if you can get it in this area, I don't know if there's much property available. I actually drove around looking for property, did some map, uh, looking on Google Maps, and uh, this would be great if you could get in that area because you have better access to 189 and 40. Um, so the yellow represents travel times from this new station um, and the Midway station of eight minutes or less, 90% of the time. Blue area, four minutes or less. So you can cover the, the highest populated uh, area. So, this is a fire station, but it's a unique fire station. Uh, it looks pretty fancy. It looks fancier than you think it is, but it's an example of a unique station consideration. These large monolithic fire EMS stations are becoming more and more rare because they're too darn expensive to build. In this case, this is a mixed-use facility, but it also has a typical fire station layout on the first floor. There's commercial space here, and there's four stories of residential apartments. So essentially, this fire station produces income and reduces fire station costs. So in the future, I would suggest Heber, or the fire district, look at some, these, some sort of unique configuration uh, for the Heber City Fire Station that could substantially lower your cost and actually bring in ongoing revenue. <clears throat> so, conclusion, we know that all these recommendations would entail substantial additional costs. We know that. It's a lot of money. 
They don't have to be all or none. These can be done incrementally. You can set your priorities. We think adding more personnel needs to be a priority. We think the merger of uh, the two organizations should be a priority, whether it's a legal merger or at least a temporary functional or operational merger. So, what our recommendations are. This is a growing, as you guys are well, well aware, this is a growing county. And the current fire department is at very bare minimum. And it needs to be, as this community grows, you need to be prepared to the proper fire protection, proper emergency medical services. Adequately, I would say. Nothing that we're suggesting is <coughs> is fluff or Cadillac stuff. <clears throat> it's a reorganization and prove your staffing, merge the two organizations. And we, we strongly believe that um, if you follow these recommendations, the result's going to be a more efficient, more cost effective, and a higher quality fire protection in the We strongly believe that. Questions? Can you go back two slides? <laughs> okay, so on here, uh, a merger should be a priority. The second bullet point, again, administrative and functional collaboration. How would that be functionally different than what we have now? <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what the question is. Okay, so the, the last red bullet, a merger of Washington County MS and Washington County Fire District should be a priority. Yes. On the second recommendation, because you have three choices there, one of them is not showing up. Begin with administrative and functional collaboration. Are you with me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So begin with administrative and functional collaboration. How is, how is that different than what we have today? Well, you essentially kind of have an operational collaboration right now. You don't technically have an administrative and functional collaboration. Um, well, actually, functional should be operational. Uh, but administrative, so you, you uh, combine some of, uh, you essentially, from the administrative standpoint, you can com combine some of the main administrative functions. The fire chief oversees everything. Now, Claire doesn't have his own administrative assistant, correct? I do now. Oh, you do? This works strictly for EMS? Just recently. Okay, so you combine some of those functions and you combine training and some other, there's a, there's a whole list of stuff that you can combine. And um, so you operate that way. So you operate as if you were one organization, um, or you, both administratively and operationally, until you can work out legal, budget, and other issues. Does that make sense? Essentially, they, the two organizations have to sit down and go, okay, what would it look like <clears throat> if we're eventually merged, and how can we do that? Uh, and there's challenges to that because essentially, there's you've got two bosses. The fire chief has two bosses. Um, you know, we're suggesting that Claire's position be moved over to, as battalion chief of the EMS, so he would go into that role, but he's still getting paid by the county. Well, Make sense? Thanks, Mark. I go those lines with the merger. Uh, you mentioned that it works for some communities and it doesn't work for others. You are recommending that it will work for ours. I'm just curious. When I say it works, what I meant was, um, what I said was that um, we're not prejudiced towards a fire based EMS system. Um, that you merge fire with EMS. It works in some communities and other communities. It doesn't. Like the two communities I did last year, city owned, county owned, it wasn't in the cards. It wouldn't have worked well um, for those particular communities based on a whole bunch of issues. But in Wasatch County, it totally makes sense to merge them into one organization. Because the question what? is, I'm just curious, throughout the state of Utah and maybe the Western United States, what, uh, what do you see most with the communities? Are they merged or not merged? Well, I couldn't tell you in terms of numbers. 
Um, I see both all the time. Um, just finishing one in North Carolina, very large county-owned third service. Um, not any intention to, to merge at all with the fire department. I just did one in Summit, Con Summit County, Colorado, where it was a county third service, like here, and we recommended, and they're going, they're going to take those recommendations, that that county third service merge with one of the local fire districts. So it just depends. There's just I can't give you a black and white answer. Just there. You know, I, I'm working with the state. I think a lot of times they don't work just because they don't want to merge, and they're being forced to merge. And I think the big um, plus we have with with Wasatch County is they want to merge, and, and they work together well. Um, but working with the whole state, there was some that they just they just did not want to work together. If, they wanted if, to keep independent. If labor doesn't want a merger, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And if, if firefighters and EMS providers, if they raise enough stink and they don't want anything to do with it, it's not going to happen. So question, you um, said that it doesn't necessarily save money to merge. So what are what is it that you're seeing for our county that makes this a positive to merge? Efficiency, efficiency. Maybe, th sometimes there are cost savings, sometimes there isn't, but it's not the sole motivation. My point was it's not the sole motivation to go into a merger, it's to save a bunch of money. If you can do that in a merger, great. But I would see more efficiency and better service. 